session um, like next month once the new student ordnung um, is accredited and then you can switch to the new one which is uh, for the new first semester it's going to be mandatory and you can switch to the new one it does have some differences for example your statistic grade counts uh, which may be a reason against uh, doing it for many um, but there is a ninth module called methods of cognitive science and you can select you will then select five of these nine modules um, and this module was made for courses like this. Um, this, the basic programming, Python class, Unity classes, um, um, other statistics classes, and so on. And yeah, for that module, you need uh, so statistics. And the new statistics course taught by Franke from next semester on will be the mandatory classes. And um, then you need for the to uh, fill up the module, you need 12 other credits eight of which must be graded. So you can take one ungraded seminar into this, um, but uh, to allow you to take this one as a graded seminar into that, you can get a, a grade in this class as well. For that, you will have to take a final exam, however, you don't need to really get to that. And if you didn't understand what I just said, wait for the introductory session next month by then. Um, yeah, so basically you can decide there what to do, but in general you will have to do um, 10 homework, so in any case, so you don't have to worry too much upfront about that. Um, yeah, and so the plan is that everybody who passes these 10 homeworks will also pass the course, so you can think of it as that you get 1.0 um, points on the final exam, so if you have uh, 10 times, yeah, 
1.0, you have one bonus mark, so to say, and on the final exam you will at least get a 4.0. Um, however, you don't have to take the final exam if you just want to get a pass, but you can still take the final exam. And if you are very bad, you will still get a pass. But if you want to get a grade, um, then you can take the final exam and yeah, probably get a much better grade there. Um, yeah, the final exam will be also something, hopefully, we can do some interactive programming exercises also there, and no coding on paper, but we are still developing this. Okay, then just quickly about us. So my name is Rüdiger, as already said, like I'll probably be soon a first semester PhD student um, and in my master's thesis like this week. Um, yeah, right now um, in parallel I'm working at AIM-INSERV over at the ICO and I have like four years of um, Python experience, if you want to call it like this. Okay, that is yours. <laughs> I'm Chris, uh, yeah, I'm in my fifth master. I worked at AIM-INSERV <laughs> and yeah, same ex Python experience, I guess. Yeah, okay, and in general, um, if you have any questions or so, please don't hesitate to write us or write in the forum. Actually, writing in the student forum is best because then um, everybody can see the answer if people have similar questions and also you could help each other. However, if you feel ashamed of your question, you can also write us an email, but there should be no reason actually to do this. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry? Okay, and you can also use Bluebar on Stood IP. I personally haven't <laughs> done that, but it's probably totally cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you have content suggestions, please also write us. So we have a schedule for the lecture, but if many of you feel that you want to learn about something a little bit else, then we can also shift, so we are flexible on that. Um, yeah, if you find also errors in the homeworks on the slides, uh, please also report this. You can directly do this on GitHub, where we will host all the all the stuff and it's best if you do it via GitHub issue, then we have it directly there where the content is, but you can also write us. Okay, so one final remark, so it's very important, so this lecture is really for you. So last year we already did the same lecture, we recorded all the lectures, we put all the slide material online, so there would be basically no reason for us to stand here and talk, except for you. So we really like want to make you, uh, uh, to, to make it possible for you to learn as much as possible from this lecture and for that it best if you actively participate and actually also um, ask if you don't understand something so we can help you with the stuff that you uh, struggle the most. And really if you sit here and don't understand something, just uh, raise your hand and ask, or otherwise it's really just a waste of your time and that's no good. Okay, so with that we can actually um, do some content if there are no questions regarding the like setup stuff right now. Okay, so why are we doing scientific programming at all? So we want to be scientists, not uh, software engineers, right now at least. Um, so uh, this slide tries to give a maybe not non-exhaustive uh, definition of what science tries to accomplish. So um, it's definitely not all, but I hope we can all agree that this is uh, part of what science tries to do. So, science, so we try to build and organize knowledge. We want to test explanations about our world and uh, what's also often underestimated is that we also need to communicate these results to others. Um, and doing all this, we want to do it systematically, objectively, and transparently, and reproducibly. And the claim is that otherwise, what you're doing is probably not science. So, probably doing something else. And so, and we believe that using programming, uh, we can basically do do a lot better on all of these topics. So. Um, for building and organizing knowledge, we can use databases um, to share our scientific results. Also for testing uh, explanations, we can use code to automate our experiments. Um, especially for communication, we can share um, the code uh, that we use to generate and analyze our results with others. And that's, that is often much more understandable than just having a paper. And also for doing things, things systematically, it's really better to use some code um, uh, for objectivity. At least computer programs are not so much uh, subject to human biases. Still, computer programs are written by humans, so uh, you don't get the bias uh, totally away, but at least it is made obvious what you are doing there. And the same basically holds for transparency and reproducibility. So if you can really share the code that uh, where basically is, the code is basically what you really did there, uh, then no, no one will uh, have any doubts about what you actually did to uh, yeah, basically get to some results. 
And also for reproducibility, then if you share the analysis or the code that you use for your analysis, everybody can redo the same analysis and hopefully they'll get the same result. And you don't say, okay, I clicked a, clicked a bit around in an Excel sheet and in the end I got uh, that the result is significant and here's the paper. And then that was the last time this result was seen. Okay. So, yeah, also word of warning here. So if you really want to get the benefit of all of your points, you need to invest a little bit in writing clean code. So scientific code often has a dubious reputation of being like uh, a little crazy and like people don't really, like no one except the scientists who wrote the code can understand it. We want to get a bit away from this <laughs> and um, yeah, basically show you how to write code that also others can understand so that you can communicate with others on the code. Okay, so why are we using Python for that? A little bit of background. So Python was created in the 90s by Guido von Rossum. It's an open source project. Um, and it's now managed by a foundation, a Python Software Foundation. And it's a very high level language, so you don't really need to know the inner workings of your computer to uh, get something done there. It's interpreted and dynamically typed. This is maybe interesting from a programming language theory point of view, but for us it just means that we can um, focus more on the stuff that we do and um, not so much about writing code or like not, not so much think more think more about the science and not so much about the code. It has a very consistent and minimal syntax so and just means it's easy and write uh, it's easy to learn and to write. And um, most importantly it also has a great community and a great ecosystem. So for every question that you have you can probably ask on the internet and you will find someone who helps you and um, yeah who will help you and also there are a lot of packages who probably already do what you want to do. Um, there are, of course, there are alternatives uh, uh, to using Python for scientific code. Our opinion is just that Python is better um, for using it. Uh, here we have made a list about some alternatives uh, and why Python is better. So the first, yeah, to see is MATLAB. Um, so maybe in the early 2000s, more or less everyone was using MATLAB. So and I think MATLAB is really the worst that you can use. So <laughs> the problem with MATLAB is um, yeah, it's a proprietary software product. So everybody has to pay a lot of money to first get it. And uh, if you want to get the new version, you still have to pay. So what every half a year, you have a new version. What often happens, labs buy like a version for all of the members, and then they don't update the version for 10 years. So everybody is uh, hanging back on the old software. And if you write a program in a different version and you want to share this, no one can execute it because everybody has a different version. So uh, really it's best to save the money and just don't touch MATLAB. Um, yeah, some of you might also know Java um, from <laughs> uh, Info-A or something. So Java is probably uh, has its place in really big software engineering projects, but uh, for scientific code where you want to iterate fast and mostly there are not so many people working on the project, it just makes things overly complicated and there's no really good compelling reason to use it. Um, and there's C++. Uh, C++ is probably a cool language. It's like more maybe the fastest language that you can get. Everyone is always comparing the speeds to C and C++. However, it's very difficult to actually get something done in C because you can have such a lot of power. Um, and with great power comes great responsibility. So you most of the time you just crash your program. And um, also it's very difficult in the ecosystem. So there are libraries, but there's usually no documentation, so you're left alone figuring out how to actually use the libraries, so we want to save you the frustration and don't use C++. Then we get in the realm of maybe uh, things that actually are used for or are used more often for scientific uh, code, so there's R, R probably you know, this is like statistics focus language, and um, the thing is, yeah, it's probably nice because it's also an open source project, uh, so many statisticians love to use it, but we just think that uh, Python is very, it's like a general purpose language where you can really do everything that you need to do, and in R it's really just statistics, so um, probably everything you can do in R you can also do in Python, but not so easily the other way around, so we just think also there's no great reason to use R. And then finally there's a new kid on the block, it's Julia, so I think that's really the newest language here, 1.0 was just released last year, and it has a little bit of hype, so um, the claim is that you can write code very easily, like uh, like in Python, but still be almost as fast as in C. However, since it's still very new, um, it's not very major, 
And also it's not so versatile as Python, so you can still, there are a lot of more libraries and things you can do in Python that you cannot do in Julia. Maybe if you write really hardcore numerical algorithms, you might want to have a look at Julia, but uh, for us, for this purpose here, it's also not really required. So, yeah. So the, now we basically show you um, more or less a high level view of the contents that we will cover in this lecture. And this is our path through the scientific Python. <coughs> so we start in the beginning here, and we go on back with basic Python. So we basically teach you, um, probably all of you heard info A or some have some programming background. So we teach, so if you don't know yet, we teach you how to do the basic programming things um, you know in Python and also some advanced uh, things. And then we get to like uh, the core of the scientific ecosystem where we have like uh, um, stuff. Yeah, okay, we have Python, then we have like IPython, which is like an interactive uh, way to interact with the Python interpreter so you can really quickly prototype things. Then we also use Jupyter, which is like an interactive notebook environment. So uh, you can intermix the outputs of your program with like uh, explanations and text. And yeah. That's basically how it looks. So this is uh, the IPython shell where you can just yeah you can type commands, and this is Jupyter where you have like a notebook and you. The cool thing is really that you write some code and then you directly see the output beneath that code and that really makes it easy to, um, yeah, to really understand what you're doing and from from my perspective it's really like the best way to do scientific analysis. Um, yeah. So then we go to NumPy, which is like. Uh, <coughs> the Python library for fast scientific com uh, or new numerical computing. So if you have large amounts of data, you probably want to use NumPy because otherwise you will not be quick enough. There used to be a slide there, um, <laughs> but you'll see it soon enough. Um, yeah, then we do a little bit of plotting uh, with matplotlib. So matplotlib is also like the most common plotting library in Python. Um, you can make all kinds of plots that you can ever think of in matplotlib, and we'll teach you how to do this. Looks uh, like this, maybe. So you can make db plots, you can make graphs. That's a very important tool. Um, then on the ah uh, yeah, and then also very important here we have three lectures on pandas. Pandas is like uh, the so to say Python replacement for Excel. I uh, have it here. So you have tabular data and um, yeah, you can basically make tables and you can make all kinds of operations with tables and then it's like the way to go to do analysis on kinds of on any kind of tabular data. And yeah, then finally we'll do some statistical visualization. So after my we we show you some advanced ways of making, so to say, visualizations that really uh, explore the data easier um, using some other libraries. Uh, so you can basically make plots like this in just a few commands. Mm -hmm. And then also, yeah, we have one lecture on statistical modeling, and we show you how to make, for example, a t-test or some linear regression in Python. And yeah, this will look like this, where you get like uh, very detailed analysis of your statistical stuff. And then finally, we have, or well not finally, but at some point we also have experiment, which will be about like doing psychophysics experiments in Python, where you can basically code up your experimental analysis in Python and then have people take your experiments and then you can analyze your data. So for example, for stuff like eye tracking, also you could do this there. And so in the end, our aim is to give you like a full circle uh, workflow uh, where you can do from making your own experiments, recording the data to then extracting and pre-processing the data, exploring and visualizing the data and then making some statistical analysis of that and so then writing your paper and or just using Python and using the tools that we teach you here in this course. Okay, so as announced in the beginning, uh, we try to make this lecture less talking and do more uh, coding. So we prepared some, so to say, a whirlwind tour through the things that we do in this course. So please go to this. Um, if you have a laptop, go to this uh, URL. I will leave it on here um, for some time so everybody can get there. Sorry? Tiny presentation. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, so you go to this lecture, uh, you go to this URL, this is our lecture repository, and then you click on this launch binary button, and then you will be taken to an interactive computer environment called Jupyter Lab, which is what you use for this course most of the time. And yeah. So, did everybody find the link? Then. I will try to open it up here as well. Hmm. We are having trouble. Hast du Internet? Geht so. Nicht so, ne? Hmm. Hast du sonst das aus? Ich kann noch die Internet ausmachen. Yeah, so once, once you're there, we will show you in a minute, you can go to week one introduction, and then um, there's a file called whirlwindtour.ipyv, and so just open up this file, and there you can see um, just what we prepared for you, so right now you don't really have to do any coding, just execute um, stuff here. Yeah, and Where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so everybody found the notebook. Can you open it? Do you have internet connection? <laughs> so like when, when you are on the first, uh, if you click on launch binder and get to a page that looks like this, you go here, week one, welcome tour, and then a notebook like this should open up. So who has it opened? Okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, so maybe, maybe just about if you wonder what Binder actually is. Um, Binder is a service, I think, developed in Berkeley at like the Institute of Data Science or something, where you can um, just put put a repository and they will create an, yeah, create this environment for you online uh, where all the dependencies are installed that we specified in the um, repository so you can just start coding and you don't have to install anything right now. And yeah, with this, with this um, we just want to give you like a, yeah, just show you what we will do in this course and give you maybe a feeling of how it will be like do this course, um, yeah, okay, so, still loading? <laughs> okay. Okay, so some people already have it going. Um, for the others, I will just basically skip through um, what we have here, and you can try this uh, in the meantime yourself. So basically, in a Jupyter notebook, you have like this blue cursor. This indicates at which cell you are right now, and then you can press Shift Enter to execute a cell. Actually, so if you press Shift Enter here, you will get the result just below the cell, and you will also be taken to the next cell. So basically, you can just go through the whole notebook pressing Shift Enter all the time. Um, so this is like one cell for each lecture that we are going to have. Um, so we start with basic Python. You can see here we have some while loop where we count up to 10. So some basic stuff like this. We will start easy. Then next time we will have more advanced Python in the next week where we will teach you some like uh, basically explain a bit how the language uh, works uh, or the inner workings of the language and have some fancy code and then also just count to 10 in the end. Um, then this, there's NumPy, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you see here, so this is about really numerically computing with larger matrices and stuff. Then we make some nice plots with matplotlib, like this one. Um, then for pandas, yeah, we'll have this um, three lectures where we teach you how to do everything with this kind of tables here. Um, then we have stats models for doing statistical analysis. So where you can see like here if your stuff is significant or not. And then statistical visualizations here, we have some more advanced stuff where you can like create some beautiful looking plots like this here. 
Yeah. Or actually, uh, for here, this is only just so the, for the plotting is just one line. <laughs> so. <laughs> and then we'll have this lecture will be actually new, so we didn't have this last year that we'll do an interactive data analysis because often you have some data that's like you can look at it from a lot of different angles. Oh, this is. This will not work here, but it should work on your machine. So if you do this plot, you should have two um, yeah, controllers here, and you can shift a bit around here, and you should see that this um, this line actually responds to it. And then also in the same lecture, we'll do a bit on interactive plotting, where you can make plots like this, and then maybe have something where you can have a scatter plot and then have an interactive histogram on the bottom and stuff like that. So, and then we have. In the end, we have a final lecture on performance optimization. So this will also be new. We didn't have had it, uh, have it. We hadn't had it last year. We did not have it last year. So and in this lecture, we'll just show you a bunch of tricks how you can make your Python code going fast if you really need to do so. Most of the time, the libraries are efficient enough that you don't need to do anything. But sometimes you have if you have large amounts of data, it can be helpful. So and then we'll show you tricks like where you can have the same code and just add one line. And then we'll have here a function we have go slow and go fast. Um, and we, if we time it, so we have go slow takes like 500 microseconds and go fast only takes 30. So and we didn't change any code, we just told it to be a bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, it for the like very top level view of what we're going to do. Um, if you are excited that's good so um, so this is like the outline for the, the week so each point is now it's a different week so where we have a focus on a specific topic um, basically the same thing as I just showed you and just for comparison here's the structure of the basic uh, programming in Python course so if you somehow feel like yeah, okay, so this is from last year, so probably it's a bit different this year, but in general, so uh, that's what you can expect. So if you feel unsure, you should rather take the basic course. So um, this is what they'll do. So we'll just basically cover, like, they also do like NumPy and stuff, but we'll just basically do this in the first two weeks and then uh, just focus on really scientific applications and not so much about basic programming. Yes. So that's it for that stuff. And now we'll have some Flickr questions. Because we also want to get to know you and um, yeah, make a small survey of what you are interested in, what your background is. You can and do that with your phones or with your laptop. It shouldn't matter. Yeah, you can either go to the URL or try the QR code. And yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, now the first one should be on the Is it?
Uh, there should be a none of the above option. I have no clue why it isn't there and why I can't edit, but never mind that. Um, okay, I will just put in a few more here. So this will take some time. Okay, next one should be up. I should see, right? Just don't answer it if you would answer none of the above wherever I found it this option. Working better for you guys? Is that working okay for you? Are you on the phone? Yeah. 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 You done? Or the
das, wenn ich jetzt gleich gleichzeitig Python zu installieren. Mal sehen, ob das so gut funktioniert. Ich merke, es ist per PWP, PWP, 1, 2, 3, 4, PWP, 1, 2, 3, 4. Hm? Ich mache einen zweiten User und dann zähle ich auf den nochmal da. zu haben, wenn man ziemlich smart ist. Also das mal hat man schon noch nicht. Dann wusste man halt überhaupt nicht, was stimmt das? Also das muss stimmen. Ich kann mal Steuerung C drücken oder so. Das ist halt so eine Steuerung oder Command. Das ist schon ein bisschen zu mir. Das ist halt alle. Warum müssen wir das tun? Wenn wir nicht mit Steuerung sein, dann müssen wir das tun.
Und im Leben habe ich gehört, es sollte nicht so genug, aber ich mache eine Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass das ja ein bisschen bestimmt ist. Und ich glaube, keine Sicherung mehr war, das war ein bisschen gut. <laughs> all right, um, that were all these questions. I wish I could see the other screen now. Um, okay. um, so yeah, not many people uh, want to take the exam. Maybe we can wait for this for a bit and then um, ask it again. Um, but yeah, could be a shorter one. Um, uh, Lightning is not. Oops. Um, okay. Um, yeah, this question is only important because we are not so certain we can help you that easily with Mac, but it shouldn't be a problem, so we don't mind about that. Um, we are going to have an introduction for Git and the shell next week, so uh, even today if we get to that. So we will uh, introduce you to Conda virtual and uh, to Conda's virtual and to the Unix shell to Git and to Jupyter notebooks, of course. So um, if you click none of the above here, that's not too important. Um, and yeah, we will have the first three lectures or something, and then the last about multiprocessing again. Um, about these topics, so this should be fine too. And yeah, um, there is the none of the above um, option list in here. However, we expect you all to have some programming experience. So if you didn't take any programming class at all, um, we think you're wrong here and you should go to a basic programming. However, if you think you have any programming experience, um, that should be fine. So. That's really neutral. And where are we again? There is something with the ladies in there. Oh, here, I'm not allowed to do this. What are we going to code for? Ah, this one. And this one, yeah. We will not do much machine learning big data stuff here because, I mean, working with pandas data sets is also kind of working with beta, big data. Um, but not the kind you would use um, if you want to code uh, for real data science or machine learning. So um, 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 programming, in, uh, implementing artificial neural networks with artificial, implementing artificial neural networks with TensorFlow uh, taught by Luke next semester or uh, by somebody else next semester will probably be a better approach for that one um, because we will mostly be about experiments here. Um, However, as it's also a general Python class, um, it could also make sense to be here in any way. Okay, um, after that now, we want to um, get you all to install Python. And it would be awesome if we could do it right here, right now. So I will try to install Python on another user account of my laptop simultaneously with you, such that in 45 minutes, we should all be done and all have installed Python. I hope that works and I hope the internet is okay and um, it will work with um, getting the requirements for this course. And then we should by next Thursday all have Python installed. If it shouldn't work, no problem. So yeah. that would be all of the work for Conda installed, if that's fine? Yeah, it should be. I, will, I have it somewhere here. Okay, so, yeah, sorry. Um, Python 3. Nobody uses Python 2. If I see anybody using Python 2, I'm just going to throw you out of this class. <laughs> Seriously. So, um, what, was, what was the counter here? Is Python 2 dead yet? Okay. Yeah, there's a website. Is Python 2 dead yet or something? Ah, now it's only on Hacker News, but yeah. There was, there's some, is Python 2 dead yet counter? And um, Python 2 will be dead in um, a few months. When is it? 220? I think it's 220. 220 Python 2 will officially be deprecated. And I mean Python 3 is 10 years old, so please use Python 3. Okay, um, which uh, IDE are we going to use? 
So there are really many IDEs. Some of them are more professional than others and they have other purposes. Um, please save, your save yourselves the pain and don't code in notepads that are, which, which don't have any code completion and which just have nothing besides the pure text. That's annoying, please don't do that. Um, other than that, like I said, there are many um, IDEs. So PyCharm and Visual Studio Code, for example, are ones for really professional projects where you have a lot of collaborators on a single project. You have a lot of individual files. You have dependencies which are complex to resolve and stuff. Um, we won't need as much for this class. So we don't recommend for this class using PyCharm or something. Otherwise, PyCharm and Visual Studio Code are awesome editors, um, but not for now. Um, last year, we um, told you to use Atom. Atom is pretty nice because Atom is a simple editor, but it can connect to the Python um, interpreter such that you can run code directly from Atom. Um, but because Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab can do that too, um, we are going to use simply Jupyter Lab here. It's what you just saw in Binder. If you use Jupyter Lab, you simply make um, you you make um, a server where your kernel runs, your Python kernel runs, which is where you execute your, your Python, and then your browser simply connects to that server, and then inside your browser you have all your nicely formatted code already, and you can have every kind of code completion and inspection. You can add everything to Jupyter Lab, and which this is what we're going to use here. So it contains all you need, and it's great for interactive development, as we will do here. Yeah, don't code in notepads or something. Okay. Um, then next up, there are virtual environments. So we, um, we use Python always in a virtual environment. And virtual environments basically are sandboxes for your Python and its packages. Especially if you use a Unix-like system like Linux and Mac, um, it's Python is probably going pre to be pre-installed on your computer already because um, your operating system also needs it. But if you install other packages or if you update the version of Python, um, there may be problems that your operating system expects other versions um, and has incompatible code, and you may break your operating system or critical components of it if you install everything into your system Python. Um, because of that, you can, to, to not do that, you can use virtual environments. And a virtual environment is basically a, a sandbox for Python and its packages. So you have a Python distribution a Python binary inside your virtual environment, and every time if you um, activated your environment, everything you're going to do is only going to um, be, so it's all, it's all going to use the Python in this environment, and it doesn't change the system Python. And if you install or update or downgrade or delete packages, you're, you're only going to delete packages for this Python, such that you can have different versions of Python with different packages side by side. Um, in repositories, if you um, copy code from the internet, most of the time uh, you're going to have a requirements.txt file and that contains simply a list of all the requir requirements you need to install or a YAML file which we're going to use. And you can simply say, I want a new environment and please install all these packages into this environment. And then you're going to have a sandbox of your local Python. You won't break anything else and you won't um, change anything else from the original Python and you just have it inside this environment. And once you want to work in this environment, um, you can activate it. And that's it. Yeah, for virtual environments, there are um, many different virtual environments. There's virtual environment, there's venv, and there's conda. Conda is the easiest option to, uh, option to get your virtual environments on all platforms. And if you want to know some conda commands, um, they are given here in the cheat sheets. Um, I will probably also need to look into that from now on. OK. And so, like I said, I want you all to install Anaconda or Miniconda. So, Anaconda is a Python distribution. So, there are several Python distributions. For example, for Windows, there's also WinPython, and that is simply something you download which contains the Python binary, the, the Python interpreter, the Python compiler, um, and uh, some packages or, not, or no packages and some other stuff. And Anaconda is perfect for scientific computing because it contains all the packages necessary for scientific computing and its own package manager. A package manager is simply something you need to download additional packages. For example, we just um, told you there's NumPy, there's SciPy, there's Matplotlib. All these packages are not there in the standard Python, 
and you need to either download them manually or you take Anaconda, which already has them pre-installed. So there are two options. There are Anaconda and Miniconda. Anaconda is a huge package which uh, contains more than 720 packages already, all the ones we have, but a bunch of packages more, like Sun Python, if you want to analyze the sun, uh, for example. So there are really unnecessary ones, and it's really huge, and I wouldn't recommend installing it now because the Wi-Fi is not too good, and we are like 80 people downloading simultaneously. Um, so I would recommend installing Miniconda. Miniconda is the same distribution as Anaconda, just without all these pre-installed packages besides Conda, but Conda is the package manager and you can just use Conda to um, download all the packages we need and it on, it's only one line of code because we provided the list of packages. Okay, to do so, um, I think that QR code should lead to this tiny.cc slash Python presentation link and it's this very presentation uh, such that you can open this presentation locally and get to all the download links and work, start installing your Anaconda right now. So, um, these are the install instructions for Miniconda and Windows. These are the ones for Miniconda and Linux. Um, for Mac, it's also given in the, um, in the um, in ins installation readme, which is in the GitHub repository, which is this one. Oh shit, I should give the link to. Okay, I will leave this open for now such that you can go to that link and then you can install Anaconda and I will do it simultaneously to you guys. Okay, so I will need to um, turn the screen off for that because I will also switch user and do it myself. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you can also just Google Miniconda and you will probably get to the same yeah. download link. Yeah, so if you encounter problems while installing, just raise your hand and we'll take a look at it. We'll do the same now simultaneously on a big screen. I did it twice to test it yesterday, so I'm confident that it works. Ah, okay, I forgot the screen doesn't work. Yeah, echt große Probleme mit Firefox. I don't know why it's Firefox. So I install um, uh, VS Code well, last year. And by the way, to test if you even need to install Python, um, you can run, I think it's on all systems, you can run where Python. Um, ah, you can't. Okay, on Windows it's where Python, on a Unix-based system it's, it's which Python, and if it tells you, um, well, either nothing, then you don't have any Python installed at all, uh, or it tells you something on Unix-like systems user bin Python, then you don't have Anaconda installed. Um, if it answers you something like, some random path slash anaconda three an anaconda three slash bin slash python or something. Never mind. If anaconda three is in the path of which or where python, then you already have anaconda installed and you don't need to install anaconda. Um, on this, because I just set up the new, uh, I just set up my laptop a new and a new account. Um, I don't have it installed, so I need to go here and do the same thing. Oh no, I don't want to do it on the website. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's a path, then it's like this. Then why am I?
wechsle dann noch einmal hin und dann wieder zurück. So that's new for everybody or is yours still not in force? Ich nicht so, als hätte ich das nicht irgendwo. Ich kann das ja halt auch mal ohne dich tun, einfach so, als hätte ich das auch. Nee, aber ich weiß nicht, kann ich jetzt gerade nicht auf die Adapter zu werfen. No, geht's downloaded. <lacht> Okay, so I'm imagining I downloaded it now. Uh -huh. um, I've used the terminal, so this again, this is on uh, Unix-like systems. I used the terminal to switch and uh, to change directory to that very part where I downloaded it. Um, and I simply run bash and then that file. Uh, on Windows, you don't even need to do that because on Windows it's a graphical installer. Um, I have it written somewhere here. On Windows you have to make sure to add it to your path because otherwise you won't use it from your Windows command line. Um, same holds for Linux because um, we have to say yes when it asks to add to the terminal. We will do that here. I read that already, of course. And yeah. So if anybody is having problems, or uh, how far are you? Did you download it yet? Who has it already downloaded? Oh, the internet is faster than mine. Okay. <laughs> Good option. Yeah. Um, that's the option for Unix-like systems. It asks us to add it to the Bash RC. So before I do that, oops, um, before I do that, I'm just going to demonstrate again. I mean, I guess I can show that here. So when I asked where Python, uh, or which Python here, it said it uses the user bin Python. Now if I add it to my bash RC um, and start a new terminal, and I now run which Python, it will use the correct one because it's the mini condo one. So if this is your result of which Python or where Python, or if there are multiple lines, but this one is the first, um, then you're right. Then we have installed it successfully. Yeah. So for the installation of Windows, um, there is a in the graphical installer there is the advanced option at Anaconda to your path and then you find the exact option here. Yeah. At Anaconda to your path, whatever it, it says. Ich hatte bei irgendwas von irgendwas installieren, hatte ich Probleme, weil ich keine Akten habe. Das ist nicht so der Akten geworden. Ich habe da heute Morgen versucht.
What did you mean? Um, no, I think that's supposed to be blocked. I'm not, not sure what you're talking about. But what are you, so what are you talking like about? Is, is it a slide in the, the slide set? Or? No, it's about this GitHub and this introduction with this code. Yeah. It has a video. Okay. So and you can, you can edit it. Ah, okay, so this is the problem. Like if you, <coughs> if you go to the notebook directly on GitHub, so GitHub just renders just renders the notebook statically. So what you should do is not, when you're on GitHub, not go to the notebook via GitHub, but first click launch binder. Like when you are on the, on the repository side, there's a button uh, just below like all the folder structures. It's called launch binder. And there you click and then you are taken to the environment where you can actually run the code and not just look at it. Okay, uh, so if, so. Wait, I will, um, so imagine if this is here, the, wait, where are we? So if you would open it only here, um, GitHub only renders it. Oh, you know this one, right? But never mind. Python, it should be Python version 3.7. So um, if you install Miniconda from the fresh version, it should be simply install Python 3.7. And um, we could do this. So you should also need to, you should also install Git. Um, I have installed Git globally in my system. And because of that, if I make a new user, it's already installed. I can test that by running which Git. And if it returns some path, I know I have Git already installed. For Windows, it would be where I did. God. What do you mean? Where? Doesn't this work? Okay. Works for me. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Irgendwas an der Hansel und Wenn nicht interessiert, irgendwann kannst du das Push Notification bringen, dann werden die Cards heute schon fertig und dann kannst du auch mal über Windows nicht oder so. Dann ist das genau nicht. Das ist das. Das hat einfach ein bisschen Gefühls.
Ja, ich wollte hier reden. Also ähm, ich habe fast keinen Strom mehr. Ähm, der Download bricht die ganze Zeit ab. Nein, es alle, der Download bricht die ganze Zeit ab und dann will ich das einfach mal so. Ja, das kannst du auch nur so. Ja, ich habe ähm, im Netzwerk viel, das hat angefangen runterzuladen und dann. Ja, kenne ich auch. Mhm. Man hat doch noch ich habe keinen Bock mehr Ja, ich glaube, ich hatte auch gerade ziemlich viele. Und ja, so who's having some who's having issues stopping you from installing it? Like network problems and something? Um, so if you da, 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 if you go to this link, um, so this so we have all the code for the lectures in the GitHub repository. Um, we're gonna talk about what Git is and how to use Git on Thursday. Um, for now just note it's the place where you store code. So GitHub, so um, Git is a version control system used for code, and GitHub is simply um, an external server and a nice um, GUI to show that. And this link here, at least the part without the Git clone and the .git, is the repository where we have um, our lectures. So these are all lectures from last year, like I said, like Rüdiger said, and you can look at these ones to get a head start of the lectures, and we're gonna update them for this year, of course, but should be generally the same content. And yeah, there's also this markdown file installation instructions. If you open it inside GitHub, GitHub renders it nicely. Um, it has a little bit longer version of the installation instructions, um, also for Mac. So we don't have a Mac slide here, um, but I didn't have access to a Mac in the past weeks. Um, And these are the installation instructions again. So if you want to open it at home, um, write down the link, uh, rather the tiny.cc slash Python presentation um, or something. And then in these repositories, in this repository, you will find everything um, we're going to do and we did so far. OK. Um, how about the other? So who has? Python and Git already installed. Nice. <laughs> Who's still working on it, but optimistic that it will work in the next couple of minutes? Yeah, that's good. What's stopping you so far? Internet? Okay. Okay, um, for the ones still installing or not installing at all, I mean, you can look at the video or just look at the slides. I will just do the same thing as here in the slides. So I go to some directories. So I, I mean, I can also do that. Yeah. I will just make a directory. You can also do that in your explorer. Um, Python. So these are the terminal commands to make a folder and to go into that folder. And then I need to be in the terminal. So use CD to change directory. That's what it stands for. And then once you're in a folder where you want to have it, um, you simply clone this um, lectures repository. Probably also take some time because it's also not two. Okay, when I open the same folder now here, like I said, it's the same in the um, file explorer, then I don't know. Um, then in the terminal, I can just go to my the lectures folder here, and you see it's the same um, yeah. in the same as in the um, GitHub repository. And the markdown files, so my PDF reader can render markdown files luckily, such that they look also pretty for me. If you don't have uh, such a PDF reader, if you in, if you open the markdown files, they're going to look um, like normal text files with some um, instructions for how to render it. Um, but I mean, you can also read it like this, or you can just um, install Atom or here on, on Linux Ocular or something that can nicely render markdown. Or you can simply just look at the markdown file on GitHub 
because GitHub can also render it prettily. Okay, so, and also in this, um, in this lectures directory, if I, um, because if I'm on the terminal, I need to change directory to it first. And then I can look at the contents using LS on Unix-based systems and deal on Windows. Or actually, LS on the PowerShell deal. No? And then I see all my files here, and I see also this environment.yaml. And this environment.yaml is a file that simply describes um, what, it simply has the names of the packages um, we want to install. So these are all packages we need um, for the environment. And this is simply um, an instruction for uh, Conda. If we want to install an environment, we can tell Conda install an environment, as a make a new environment, and then do as specified in this YAML file. And what are we specify here? Well, we specify the name of it, specify channels. Channels are, channels are the places where um, if I install the dependencies down below, where is it supposed to look? So Conda has its own channels, and there's also Conda Forge for, um, what is Conda Forge in this talk? Um, <coughs> yeah, Conda Forge is like a special channel where like uh, the community build can build their own Conda packages so you get more up-to-date versions sometimes and also stuff that you can, don't get from the default channels, but right now you shouldn't have to worry about that anyway. Okay. And then um, we have here the dependencies. These are all the packages we want to install. We want to install Python itself, um, pip installs packages, Jupyter and stuff, Jupyter lab, and all the packages we talked about, um, we talked that we're gonna uh, use, we told you that we're gonna use. Okay, um, to install these, like it says in the instructions, so once we clone the directory, we create, oops, uh, we create a new environment, so, this is simply, um, you only clone the directory to get this environment.yaml. You can also download the environment.yaml directly. The link is somewhere here. So this is the raw file on GitHub. If you open that from the uh, repository on GitHub, um, you can simply copy this file locally on the computer as environment.yaml. And then, um, we're going to create a new environment, and the command for that is conda and so conda and like environment create minus f like file, and then the place where the environment of YAML is, which in my case because I'm already so it's from the path where I'm already on. So I'm now in home slash quiz slash slash Python class slash lectures, and then in this lectures directory there's an environment of YAML, and if I hit conda and create, it's going to um, make uh, install all the requirements that this YAML file tells it to install and make a new Python environment. This will probably take forever on my laptop because um, I don't have the best internet connection it seems and the packages are um, quite big, some of them, so it will take some time on my laptop. Um, it will hopefully run fast on yours and if it doesn't finish you can just kill it and run it at home again.
Um, and then I just switched user to another user which has, um, has the environment already running. So first of all, I can check. So on my terminal, um, Anaconda even tells me which environment I'm currently in. Right now I'm in the base environment. And when I'm in the base environment, if I ask which Python am I using, I'm using this um, Miniconda one. So this is again, this is not even the system Python. This is the Anaconda, this is um, the Python installed in this Anaconda distribution. And we just made the environment called um, scientific programming. And I check that, I can run Conda info. Yeah. I can run conda info minus minus n. It's a command that's also listed in one of the conda cheat sheets, which is on the lecture. And conda tells me on your computer there are two environments. The first one you're using, it's the base environment. Um, but there's also the scientific programming environment, which is in this path. And if I now activate it by running conda activate scientific programming, my Shell even tells me that I'm in this environment now. And for one, which Python now? It will tell me that I'm using this Python, the one in the environment, scientific programming. Um, so if I now hit conda list, it will tell me all the packages I have installed. And we see these are, among others, the packages um, we just installed, plus its dependencies. So the package pandas relies on other packages, for example, this pandas profiling, and installs it um, with it. So if I install these environments, you probably, if you're installing it right now, you see there's a huge list of stuff it's installing. These are all the libraries we want you to have, and all the libraries these libraries depend on, its dependencies. And we see, so there's really, really many um, installed stuff. To stop being in this environment, I can conda deactivate, deactivate, and I'm in the base environment again. And like I said, the set of um, packages I have in this environment is another one as inside the base environment, because if I run conda list inside my base environment, um, there's, for example, no pandas here, as we see. So there is some stuff which my mini conda installed with it, because these are really basic packages, like pip, the basic, basic Python package manager. So we use conda to install packages, but conda even internally uses, uses pip. Pip installs packages. Um, so there are some basic packages. Of course, Python itself must be there, and some other ones, but not um, the ones like uh, pandas or pygame, which we install in our environment. OK. So let's activate my environment here again. Conda activate scientific programming. And because in my environment scientific programming, there is Jupyter. There are a bunch of Jupyter packages. So this lists all the packages and takes the one where the lines takes the lines which contain Jupyter. And we see I have Jupyter and Jupyter Lab here. And um, because I have it here. I can run Jupyter Lab. Um, for those of you who are used to Jupyter Notebook, so Jupyter Lab is the newer version of Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter no Notebook could render, can render the same kind of file as Jupyter Lab. It's just that Jupyter Lab is more pretty and has, um, for example, multiple tabs, and you can um, add a terminal in your lower right corner or something, and that's um, just a prettier version, and you don't ever need to use the, leave the browser if you're running in Jupyter Lab. And we're going to start Jupyter by running the command Jupyter Lab. And like I said, Jupyter works such that it creates um, a server here. Um, and it's running on this terminal now. And it tells us, um, open in a web browser, open this link. I already opened this link on the other screen. And if I then. Um, open my brother, I'm now in some Jupyter lab. So I made the mistake of doing this in my um, home directory. I should uh, switch to another directory. Um, and for that, I can. So we can kill this again. We kill this. We kill everything on the terminal by hitting Control C. 
Then ask us, do you really want to shut the kernel down? Yes, we want to shut the kernel down. Um, let's make a new directory. Uh, sorry, let's change the directory. And let's run Jupyter Lab again in this directory. Jupyter Lab, and then I'm telling this directory I'm currently in, which is simply dot, it says home slash quiz slash something following. Yes, I didn't close the old tab. You were right on that. So I'm opening the link again, and Jupyter Lab opens here. And now, this is the place where my files are. So I can hit the plus and it opens my launcher. I can create a new file. I can, for example, create a new um, notebook where I can simply run Python code here. So this is working Python code. And furthermore, if you installed this very last step, this lab extension, blah, 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 you can even see what variables we have here by opening the variable inspector. And we can just, like I said, Jupyter Lab is really pretty. We can drag stuff around. And we see the you know, interactive Python kernel now. We have some variable called A. And it has the it's of uh, type int, interestingly. Uh, not interestingly. And it has the um, content one. So for now, say A equals not an int. And change it. And A changes now. So this is how we work in a homework. Um, so these are the um, Jupyter, uh, the IPython notebook files. We're going to talk about that tomorrow, uh, on Thursday, a bit longer. Um, I can also change the type here from code to, what did you hit, N, markdown, yeah. And then I can make a headline. And if I compile this, this makes a headline. So this, like we said, Jupyter notebooks are combinations of Python code and nicely rendered form as a text and Python output. So nicely rendered form as a text, Python code and Python output. Um, if you want to code, um, so if you have Python files you want to work on, you can also not create an IPython notebook file. If you want to have only code and not the nicely formatted text, just code you can run from top to bottom. You can also create simply a new file and save it as a .py file because the file ending necessary for Python files is .py and is this my active variable still? Oh, no, I need to say A equals like a song. Okay, this is not the variable flow for this window. Ah, I need to open the terminal, of course. So, and then for, I said this here is simply a file. I can, and then if I um, make a right click on that, um, I can select that I want to make a terminal for this. And now this terminal here is connected to this file. And that's a, uh, advantage of using the IPython. This is an interactive Python, and I can simply interactively execute shift and enter one line of code, and it will tell me, and it, execute, it will execute this here in my Python terminal. And if I ask my Python terminal what's the value of A, it will tell me the value of A is two. I can even show that to make that more visual in my variable flow. So everything I do here and one, and execute, so I can also um, make multiple lines and execute them, and they will all Python will execute it in the accompanying um, in the accompanying uh, Python kernel and show me in the very first line. Yes, and this is where we end today's session, and this is where we will start again next week. So next uh, on Thursday. So on Thursday, we will um, so continue talking about a bit about Jupyter Lab, and then about Git, and then about setting up everything you need to hand in your homework. Okay.